Okay, um, welcome to today's session. Session. Um, this is our sixth week with this cohort, and um, this will be our total of 12 sessions. And we have started recording, so we'll just dive into our classes. And this is our top session, but this is um, also the second session for the week. So, um, I think some people are still having difficulty with um, their assignment or the comment that was left um, on their assignment. If that is you, please comment on your assignments because um, it's easier to identify what assignment you are talking about or um, who is who from your assignment in particular, unless it's that kind of situation that you need to um, send me a message directly or something. But if it's about your assignment, comment on your assignment or ask for clarification. Like I mentioned, if you feel like you followed um, the timing and scheduling that was um, instructed, earlier with the assignment and you feel like you were still marked low for that, do um, comment on your assignment so I can review it. And the reason for that is that there is something that Google does with time zone. So the time zone has to be exactly the same for um, the, the Google notification or um, scheduling to look exactly the same um, on two systems, two computers. So, um, I think the time zone and maybe the location, they, they both have to be the same or something like that. And if that's not the case, then it could show you, like when an invite is sent to you, it could be showing you a different time. But then in reality, when it's time for the, um, when it's time for that meeting, you would um, get notification, like you, you when you log into the meeting, with the time that they've given you, like in the meeting at the same time that, as the person that scheduled it. I don't know how they do that. It's just a time zone thingy. Um, I, like, I'm not sure I can describe it in a way that you can understand, but just know um, it's not necessarily your fault. It's, it's a Google and time zone situation. Um, I think a perfectionist created their time zone or something. I don't know what that is about, but that's something I noticed while I was checking people's work. Um, I had to use two devices to confirm. I used the tablet and then I used a laptop and they were giving me two different things with the time zone. So it's just about the time and the scheduling, not your um, actual, not whether you actually did the work or not, just the, the scheduling of it. If um, the complaint is about how you've scheduled your timing, then um, do reach out so I can review your work. Okay, so for today, we will be discussing prototypes and flowcharts. Um, obviously, if you've been in this space or any other tech space at all, you would have heard about prototyping and, um, of course, flowcharts. Um, flowcharts also come up during conversations about, um, what do you call them, data analysis. You do data analysis to um, pick up feedbacks, basically, to um, influence Pick up feedback to influence your decision for product improvement for the most part. That's usually where um, data analysis come up. Even if it's not product improvement in itself, it could be to improve market, um, marketing efforts or marketing initiatives, which is still tied to your most times to your KPI as a product manager. So um, this is where you mostly will hear about flowcharts, but there are other situations, of course. So um, we will dive into this. One of the things we'll be discussing is prototyping, um, prototyping, low, low fidelity and high fidelity prototyping um, or prototypes, user flow, importance of flowcharts and flowchart symbols and definitions, um, iterating on designs based on feedback. So today we have fewer um, slides or well, yeah, slides or pages, um, we have just 17. So uh, I most likely will be able to take questions after the class. So if you do have questions um, about this session, this topic, do um, prepare your questions and um, be ready to ask when it's time. 
So for the site is a stage of the planning phase of software development where the product team builds an experimental simple version of the product in a bid to test how well it solves users pain points and needs okay so again prototyping is a stage of the planning phase of software development where the product team builds an experimental simple version of the product in a bid to test how well it solves users pain points and needs so um prototyping is basically building the simplest version of um is it building yeah um, um building the simplest version of your um, product to be able to tell how functional it is um especially a reference to I'm sorry about that, everyone. Um, please always make sure your mic, uh, um, your mic is muted. We are not interested in your background conversations or information. Um, we want to focus on the class. It's very distracting when um, I am speaking and someone's mic is turned on in their background and we can suddenly hear their conversations. Um, always ensure you're, you're muted while I speak. Okay. Um, prototyping is a quick way to go from ideation and development to feedback and optimizing. The product iteratively, on optimizing the product iteratively based on feedback gathered from users. The goal of releasing prototype is to ensure that the product being developed works well in the hand of, of the users. Um, just one second, guys, I need to check. So I um um I will be hoping that this this material would um delve into discussing um the difference between a prototype and an MVP because uh, I wanted to mention it but um like I think I saw something down um towards the ending about the differentiation between a prototype and an MVP they are quite similar especially um in the way they are used but they are not the same, they're not the exact same thing. So um, I will I will discuss that if I don't see it anyways, but um, let's just keep going. So um, prototype is a quick way for, to go from ideation and development to feedback and optimizing the product iteratively based on feedback gathered from users. So um, I, a prototype is majorly something that presents the structure and um, the flow. Yeah, it's mostly about the flow of um, functionality um, for users. Like when a user from, basically from a user's point of view, when a user is using um, your product, how do, does it flow from one, um, from one performance or from one functionality to the next, how do you go from signing up and then um, creating an account and then um, be able to upload your ID to complete your KYC and all those things? Just that's just the flow. It's like um, a blueprint for the flow that is intended for um, a product, right? What it does is that it's something that you can send to your control life or to a set of testers to um, have a look and give you feedback, but it can be used in so many ways, but um, this is the most common way I have seen it used, right? Um, let me also read from this material and 
So I don't want to say keep saying prototyping and nobody knows what exactly I'm talking about. Um, okay, so a model app prototype um, evaluates the general shape of your idea, the loop, the flow, the user interaction, right? So um, just to give you an idea of what that is, we keep, you keep hearing prototype, it doesn't necessarily give you the full thing, like the way um, the way your MVP would give you, but it gives you the structure, a structural representation of what you intend to build. Um, I, I I believe that should um, give you guys a little bit of uh, a little bit of an idea of what it is. Okay, uh, moving on. So in prototyping, fidelity refers to how close a prototype is to the finished version of the product. It can also refer to the level of detail, the level of detail and functionality included in the prototype version. Um, there are several different types of prototype. However, most fall into two categories, one low fidelity prototype and two high fidelity prototype. First, low fidelity pro prototype, low fidelity or low fi prototype are all about getting the core idea across quickly and efficiently. So it's, it's about creating something that gets across the idea of what it is you are doing for your products like the the, the structural stru like the structural representation of what it is you intend to do with your product um getting it across quickly like so that it takes one look to understand what it is that is intended so um the goal is not to capture every single detail of the structural representation of um uh, of your product or your intended product that's like when that then it becomes a low fidelity because it is um it is less like or it has less um similarity to the final product that's why it's low fidelity um they are great for validating or invalidating early product concepts before engineering resources are expanded low fidelity prototypes come in two types quick and rough paper sketch which are great for brainstorming. They are fast to make, easy to throw away, and perfect for scribbling or scribing down uh, ideas directly on them. Digital wireframe, I think um, if when you read about product management, you hear a lot about wireframes. And even in some um, job um, descriptions, you'll see wireframing as one of the things that you would have to do as a product manager. Um, so first, the wireframe came from the idea of sketching your um, your product, like sketching the um, the design of your product. It's, it's mostly the design because how you understand what it is you want to do. So you have a usually traditionally you would have a paper sketch, and you just draw like scribble something um, that would be called on serious like just a scribbling a little doodling and you represent the features the major features you could write words but mostly like they are boxes and um, they represent the different features that you want um, to be shown in the design and all that and um, that is where um, from that like eventually with technology there became wireframing where um, they are like digital, basically digital sketches that things that you would do on like a rough paper, um, a rough sketch. You now do it like digitally, and um, people, I think, feature is usually used for wireframing. Um, well, let's read from the material. Whereas digital frames are like digital sketches that can that you can tweak and re rearrange endlessly. Both help you focus on how the product works without getting caught up in fancy visuals or complex interactions so usually this is the, your first um this would be your first step um <clears throat> your first step with prototyping or with visualizing your your product it's um and then you 
you as a product manager, whatever it is you have in mind, who would have been sketched, right? And especially if you're in a physical or on-site role, you could have been sketched and before you have a conversation with your designer and they tell you what is um, viable or what is um, possible or plausible with the resources that you have. And then um, as you have a conversation about it, you start to edit. When you are done with that, most people will not move on to um, wireframing if they don't have a rough sketch. Most people, their very first go-to will be wireframing like because um, for someone like me, I need um, a pen and paper for my process. I, um, I, I guess I'm old school in that sense. I, I need a pen and paper to put my ideas on. Um, if it's about a product, then I'm definitely sketching what my designs would look like, um, some features that I would like, some, um, what is it called? Some so, some of the features and um, the design elements that I would like to be represented um, with my designs, um, I would write. I, I would like to sketch those, and that would be the first. That will lead the first conversation I would have with the designers, right? And then um, with that, I go on to wireframing, and um, I'm able to. Uh, most times I don't have to do the wireframing myself because it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. And it, it can be um, time consuming if you have a lot of other things to do. And um, I like having my documentations ready for whenever um, the higher ups need to see it. So I delegate this to the designers. The designers will usually, with my, wire, with my paper sketch, would usually have a good picture of what it is I want to do. And then they give me a wireframe of what I have described and we have discussed. And with the wireframing, the good thing is that with something like FigJam, you can be um, you you can be mentioned on the wireframe and you can edit it on FigJam. You can um, like if if you said someone can ask you, at Sandra, I hope this is um, I hope I got this right. I, I understood every other thing with this, but I was struggling with this. Can can you take a look and review, and then you can go and um, point out something that is different from what you had discussed or something you want them to fix. And um, usually wireframe tools are interactive usually. Um, it depends on what it is you, your team decides to use. Um, so um, it, it says here, yeah, both help you focus on how the product works without getting caught up in fancy visuals or complex interactions. It's true. Um, usually, usually prototypes are very, um, like stick drawing kind of situation is like lines. You're working with lines. So it doesn't get fanciful. It doesn't get elaborate. It doesn't have uh, characters um, or like complex characters. What you have is um, a very simplistic representation or line. I call them line, line representation of what it is you visualize for your product. Um, I'm sorry, there's an autocraft passing. Just wait a second. Okay, um, we we will go into the high fidelity. The high fidelity prototype or HiFi are closer to the finished version of the product. When building a HiFi prototype, the major or core feature of the product is usually prioritized, since that is the main hypothesis the product is supposed to validate for. While other features remain work in progress in the background. High five um, prototypes have to type. Okay, so what this is saying is mainly that um, your high five prototype would um, zoom in, in a sense, or do a focus on the main um, features, like the core features of the product. Um, I think those things would most likely fall into the basic features of the product, like there are those features that the product cannot function without, or there is no performance for the product without that. So um, you, the goal of a high fidelity product is to look to or to be closer to what it is you expect from your final product. Um, unlike the lo-fi um, um, prototype, the lo-fi prototype is more removed from the final product and um, might not focus so much on the core um, on the core features. Whereas the hi-fi focuses more on the core features and. Um, comes closer to what it is your final product is supposed to be. And um, 
Okay, and then it says that the other features could could remain um, as work in progress, um, but the, the focus is not on the other um, minor features, but on the core features. Um, so the pro the HiFi prototypes have two types, a mock-up and coded uh, prototype. When we speak of prototypes, it seems like we have dived into product design. However, it is important for you to have some knowledge of design processes and terminologies so as to effectively communicate your concept or idea of design with your design team. This is something we've, uh, we've talked about over and over again. It's um, very important that it's very important that we have an idea what it is that um, all the words that are being thrown around with um, the designers, um, with the developers. Yes, you don't have to know how to design or code, but when conversations are being had, and these are some of the conversations that you are leading, um, or you're assisting someone that is leading these conversations, you don't want to be in the dark, or you don't want to be so lost that it's obvious that you have no idea what is being spoken of. So you want to... Um, be able to just join in on conversations or hear things and know exactly what direction this conversation is going and all that. And so you can, even if you're going to assist someone in the role of a products manager, you you do your assisting role so well that it feels like you can take on the the, the main role by yourself anytime. And that's, that's always the goal for when you're starting off in any industry or space. So, um, so um, let's move on. Distinguishing between low fi and high fi, um, low fidelity and high fidelity um, prototypes. Think of low fidelity prototype as the blueprint before the beautiful house. Yes. Um, they are, I, I believe everybody knows what blueprint is, is what architects use to show the structural um, visualization of their plans for a new structure, right? Um, you as an architect you as like when when you have a new project for a new house it becomes your goal to visually represent to your clients what it is that you that they expect like with everything that they've described to you that you've had a conversation about with the civil engineers present and all that you um now want to show them the structure um the 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 wire, the wire, I'm saying wire free making, but the structure, the internal structure of the building or the basic structure of the building, um, you want to show them um, with a visual representation what it is that is expected. That's a blueprint. And the same applies to um, prototypes. They are basic sketches that map out the core layout and structure of your product using simple shapes placeholders instead of passive visuals or interactive features. Here, essential interaction is added so the, so users or um, stakeholders can invest, navigate the design, click buttons or follow links. Okay. High fidelity wireframes are like crystal clear pictures of the final product. Imagine them as little blueprints that go beyond basic shapes. So um, remember how lo-fi is mainly like line drawings, um, where it's like we went from the traditional um, sketches that we do on paper to having um, a digital sketch. So you get the, like with lo-fi, they are all sketches, but like, of course, when it's now digital, it's more uh, pronounced but still a sketch or line drawing, basically. But it's saying here that with high wireframes, they are more crystal clear and they are more interactive. Um, imagine them as detailed blueprints that go beyond basic shapes, right? Um, unlike the lo-fi. These wireframes incorporate actual content, icons, and even a hint of the plant visual style. In short, high fidelity wireframe give you a comprehensive look and feel of how the final product will function and appear. Okay, it says that my video is paused. Is that still the case? Joshua, are you there? Yeah, the video is paused from the Can someone confirm if they can still see my screen or if my screen is still paused? 
I can see your screen. Okay. Um, I'll just go on. If you, if you see trouble with seeing my screen, just send a message so I can see it. It pops up on my screen anyways. So it says here, these wireframes increase actual contents, icons, and even a hint of, of the planned visual style. In short, high fidelity wireframes give you a comprehensive look and feel of how the final product will function and appear. So like we said earlier, what differentiates um, high fidelity and low fidelity prototypes is that um, the high fidelity is more uh, representative of what the final products would look like. It has more lifelike icons. It has um, more lifelike objects or like um, the wireframe that has line objects um, um, to represent, um, basically to represent a sketch, a rough sketch, but just like in a digital um, image. The high fidelity is not a rough sketch. It shows a premium representation of what is expected of the final product. Um, the distinction between low fidelity, mid fidelity, and high fidelity. Okay, I think um, mid fidelity will be something in between, right? Um, probably something that I would represent. Um, I think something that is mid fidelity that I have seen in my line of work is um, something that represents the core, um, the core features um, boldly at damage with high fidelity representation. But then both um, those minor features, right? Those, um, those more like uh, the, the less relevant features will now be represented with the line representations with the less, uh, the less um, what do you call that? Less visualized um, representation of the final product. So um, I think it's like in between. Um, so we have fidelity, low use case early design stages <clears throat> advantage is quick and easy to create the advantage of a low fidelity is it's easy to create it explores many ideas and um it provides early user feedback before you start pouring anything into it um its advantage is that it lacks details and <clears throat> it has limited user interaction during testing right um when when a low fidelity um prototype is given to you to take a look at you will realize that you can't really click on really anything to see um the next thing like you know, like, you're supposed, you know, to, you're supposed to remember what we are talking what about, talking about like the design, design like we're talking about the flow of um, the flow of your flow of your when you click on this you want to see this when you did when you when you click on this you want to see this when you click on this is this is supposed to supposed to lead you to lead you to this or it's supposed to ask you this question so when you're being when you're being given a low five um prototype it doesn't usually um it is not usually not as interactive as what the high five will do. So sometimes you click and then like the person presenting it to you will tell you, oh, it won't click. Like, so the next thing, or there is an arrow to show you, like, this is the next thing to do, or this is what it's supposed to lead you to. It's not as interactive. So um, with the high, the high five is um, final design stage stages and stakeholder reviews. So this this the lo fi is very good um for the very early stage. Um even during brainstorming, this is where it usually comes comes in handy. But um the hi-fi but the hi-fi um is usually used for the final stage of um it's usually used for the final stage of the of the development process where yeah, um, you want to start having conversations with the stakeholders and um, bring them in and present things to them so you could um, finalize on who is doing what, when and why, and all that. So you want it to be more interactive and unlike the what you call that, unlike your 
uh, your low fidelity. So low fidelity is cool and dandy for the beginning stage, usually to be just you and maybe just the designer, right? Most likely. But then with the high fidelity, you've gotten past that stage, you're about to start putting in um, resources into it. Like you want to start coding, you want to actually start building. You no longer want the rough sketch. You want the thing that shows you how interactive your um, products will be, the visual, the real visual representation. So it says here that its advantage is that it's most re realistic representation, oh, yeah. visual and interactive elements. But then oh, yeah. on, the, on the downside is that it's time consuming to create and it's not ideal for early exploration. So we have, now we have user flows in UX design. Um, um, please do indicate again if if you can see my screen. Sometimes it just needs to be touched. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. to so sometimes it just needs um to be touched because it's a PDF file. Um, so it doesn't hibernate. So we are going into the user flow in UX design. Um, remember what UI and UX is, user interfacing and um, oh, yeah. interaction and user experience. So the user flows, um, UX flows or flow charts are diagrams that display, uh, are diagrams which display the complete path a user would take when interacting with a product or feature. The flow chart maps, the flow chart maps out a user's movement from one touch point to another throughout the user's interaction with the product. So um, what a flowchart does is that it shows um, how the interaction for the user will flow from one thing to the other. Um, it usually shows this through arrows, right? It's like not um, with, your, with your prototype, there is more um, interaction where you can click on one thing and it just moves the screen to the next um to the next action whereas a flowchart is just you're seeing arrows like it's like the normal flowchart you would do say for an office presentation you want to show how after this step um after this step we will present the files like you're doing a presentation in the office and it's just a flowchart of how you do things from one stage to the other that's more like it the flowchart just shows you um like boxes and arrows like more likely that's what you see with a flowchart. Um, a flowchart map maps out a user's movement from one touch point to another throughout the user's interaction with the product. Therefore, a, a user flow is a visual representation either, <clears throat> either written on the PRD or mapped digitally. or map digitally with the tool of a user's first interaction with the feature to the end of the interaction. So um, a user flow, which is a flow chart, is the same thing I said. Um, you can either put, put this in the um, PRD or it can be put in what, any of the tools. I think I think it's easier to do this with a FigJam tool. Um, I think FigJam was basically designed to help you out with the simplest um, communication for the beginning of your product development. Because I think so far I have used um, FigJam for um, for um, user flow or flow chart, and then I've used it for um, low-fi low um, um, prototyping. Those are the only things that I have ever had to use them for. I am not saying that they don't do other things. I'm just saying that they are much more easier to use for those things. So that's what I've used them for. And I've seen other product managers use them for too. Um, so it says uh, it's either written on the PRD or mapped digitally with a tool, like FigJam, of course, of a user's first interaction all the way down to the end of the interaction when the intended purpose of the product or feature has been actualized by the user. Each touch point has the user 
each touch point that the user would ideally interact with on the product is de depicted by a node in a flowchart, which are characterized by specific shapes, and each shape represents a particular process. Yes. Yeah. So, um, something that to note when creating a flowchart is that different shapes mean different things with flow flowchart, and your arrows mean different things um, with a flowchart. Now, you you don't have to memorize it, um, but it's good to make your work like if you're trying to create a flowchart for your documentation, or that you want to include include in your PRD, you want to be aware, like you want to be informed about how um, um, the arrows with, a, like the arrows when creating a flowchart, what they function as, what they represent, and what you want each um, shape, like when you choose a shape, what do you want it to represent um, within your flowchart, that flowchart that you're creating, what do you want it to represent, and what does it typically represent as well? Right, um, you want to be aware of those when creating a flowchart. Importance of user flows and user design it helps identify edge cases um, or feature dependencies easily. Okay, so I, I I think everybody remembers that an edge case is something that um, is not expected to happen or wouldn't usually um, wouldn't under normal circumstances or all things being equal happen, but they can occur. So they are like unforeseen situations that um, you have to plan for or you have to assume that they could happen and prepare for them. Basically, that's what it is. They are just um, accidents. Ah, I don't know, they're not really accidents, but they are just um, worst case scenario. Yes, like. A literal layman translation is worst case scenario that you want to prepare for. Um, that's, that's the best way I can um, describe edge cases. So it helps identify edge cases or feature dependencies um, easily. So feature dependencies are, um, um, how do I put this? They, they mm -hmm. are just situations where interactions between um, features, right? Like, um, one feature cannot exist without the other or like there is um, a continuous interaction between two features. The more you get into it, the more you will see conversations about feature dependencies. And um, this also influences things when you are testing. You want to make sure that the feature dependencies are plausible with the design that you have and all that. But it's nothing to worry about. Um, sometimes feature when building features for an existing product, sometimes feature dependencies or edge cases might exist and it can crop up in our blind spot areas. Designing um, flowcharts in such scenarios can help the product manager easily identify an edge case or feature de dependency that would otherwise have gone unnoticed and potentially posed a problem during the development stage. Okay, this is what I was talking about. Um, an edge case could, um, while they are not really expectations, but they are to be prepared for. Because it, if it creeps up on you um, during your um, development stage, and it like, of course, is a problem because edge case is worst case scenario, is a problem. And you have to deal with it while you are like at your finishing stage. And it could make you go all the way back and, you know, maybe not start afresh, but with that particular um, feature, you might have to go back and redo some things. And you don't want to do that. So, something that if a user flow or flow chart helps you with is that it, it creates a better picture or a, or a simplistic picture of the interactions between features and which is where you are you're also able to find out if there is a feature dependency that could result in an edge case or just a feature dependency that could just turn out not so great for your design or for your um, for your product performance um, it helps present design requirements in visual terms so as a product manager, you define your requirements for products on the PRD. As a product manager, you define you define the requirements for products on the PRD and the product designer translates these, um, these defined requirements into screens for the product. While user flows can be articulated on the PRD as use case scenarios, 
it makes the translation of the requirements easier for designers when a flowchart has been designed so they can visualize the design and direction for the product or feature. Okay, so um, your um, whatever con is contained in your PRD, they usually use the stories, right? Um, you your user story will usually go uh, as let's say as as um a student. Or yeah, as a student, I want to be a, I I want to sign on with the product and pay my school fees with ease, right? Or as an international student, depends on what your fintech is offering. As an international student, I want to be able to receive money from home and um, process my school fees abroad, something like that. If that's something you're offering, and without require when you 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 break that down into a requirement. You want the most simplistic representation of what you are saying, right? You don't want it to just be words that are written. You want it to, um, you want to create a flow of what you expect for that particular feature. So you want, um, you want payment, uh, sorry, school fees or tuition processing, right? With your bank app that you're building, and you want it for um, African students all over the world to have, like, to be able to use it for that. So you don't want to just write, I want to be able to do this and that and just leave it there. You want to have a flow chart that represents this is the process that you want. This is you want you want the um after maybe you um you, you're done with the sign up part that has been established, but um now we're talking about what do they do they click on to find the button that says um pay your tuition, right? You you put that tuition uh, like you create an icon for the tuition and uh, for the pay your tuition tab. And then you build the flow from the pay your tuition. When you click on pay your tuition, what's the next thing you want them to see? The arrow goes down and shows the next thing to be done. And then from there, what is the next thing up until they are able to successfully process their, um, their, the payout of the money they received from their parents into the school's account? So you want to show it like that. And um, so that when designers are looking at what you are expecting from this particular feature, the, like what the requirement is for this particular feature is very much more easier. And you don't have to do a lot of talking. They've, they are seeing it on the flow chart and it's easier to comprehend. And it's also easier for them to refer to it again, you know, outside of all the conversations that you have, they can just um, go back to your PRD and see um, the flow chart and it's easy for them to remember what was said. So it makes your work easier. Um, Number three, it simplifies the design process. Designing flowcharts help the product designer easily plan for easily plan for the design process. Okay, decisions such as how many screens should be designed for a particular feature, effort estimation, and any questions the designer might have at later stages of the design process. Is significantly cleared up. It's significantly cleared up once the, the product designer is able to see the design requirements defined on a flowchart. So um, usually, for your product designers, what they would need more from you, or what helps their process more and um, just makes their work easier for them and cuts down any form of miscommunication or mitigates miscom miscommunication is a flowchart. And um, here it says that one of the things it does for designers is I simpli it simplifies their design process where they are able to um, have make decisions on how much effort on um, even like, you know, when you give someone when you give someone something to design or the design on your team, what you want them to design and you've put this in the product requirements and you have to look at it and um, understand what they need to do. If they have a flow chart, they are able to tell you easily, like with so much ease and clarity, how much effort it will take, how much effort it will take to do what it is that you're asking of them. And then it also helps them like, that estimation would is more likely to be um what do you call that that estimation is more likely to be fatter right um they, they are able to give you like when you're asking we would like to find out how long it would take um we would like to find out how long it would take um to to um have our design 
um, remember we have just two weeks to prepare um, all our requirements. So how long would it take for the design team to give us um, a design? We are able to just look at your flow chart and response, right? Um, that's one of the advantages of um, a flow chart for your designers. It, cut down, it cuts down a lot of miscommunication that could occur and it just gives them the ability to um, to give you estimates of say screens that will be required the number of screens the number of the amount of effort and therefore how much time or estimated time it would need to um, accomplish what you're asking of them and just any further questions that they will have in the future they could easily just refer to your flow chart and have that answered without having to ask you it is important to note however that in the eventuality that a design or user flow is revised then the flowchart will also have to be revised accordingly. Um, okay, so here we're going to be looking at the symbols. Remember I talked about how um, the symbols or the icons in flowcharts um, mean different things or represent different things. So we have um, the terminator symbol. Um, this is the, the thing that looks like a cylinder. And um, this oval symbol marks the start and end of a user's interaction with the feature, um, with the feature or product. It marks again. It marks the start and the end of a user's interaction with the feature or product. So um, it's important to know that you just to note that you don't just use any um, shape for your icons. Like you don't just use any shape to represent anything. So this cylindrical um, shape is what you use to start the process, right? Um, the, your user flow. It's the first thing that represents the start of the process for your user. And then um, it's also what you use to end the process for your user. And then the action symbol is a rectangle. This rectangle symbolizes, um, symbolizes the steps or actions use users will take in the course of their interaction with a product actions such as scrolling or clicking or clicking a button is depicted the action symbol okay so for everywhere that um a a user would click on something would um dot something click on something um it's it should be represented the rectangle decision symbol the diamond shaped um, decision symbol is used to depict points on the user points on the user journey that would require users to make a decision the decision here are usually yes or no true or false so um, you will find that if you've ever seen like a flowchart of anything there's always have you signed for example have you signed up with us yes or no that's where you put this like the yes or no um, yes will be usually will be in one and then no will be in one if it's yes if the response is yes then the yes flows down to something else right um usually to flow down to now do this if it's no it could redirect to say now go back and sign up so you'll be able to do the next thing something like that that's what the decision symbol is for you you're having to choose between two things or more than one option um, input and output symbol. This is a rhombus. It's um, the rhombus. Shape. Yeah, the rhombus shaped output or input symbol is used to depict points on the user flow where a user will be required to either input data such as customer placing, such as a customer placing an order, or um, the system will be required to send an output to the user, such as an email verification request. I think this is clear. If a customer needs to um, type in something, right? They, they need to type in something or um, copy and paste something into a space, then that's you represent that with this room boost. But if um, also the other side of it is that if the the um, what is it called the system is you required to send an output like yes when you click you've clicked on something you're expecting the system to show you something that thing can be put in should be put in the rumbles so um it's for inputs or outputs you need to type in something or the, the system needs to bring out something or show you something or type out something for you um directional flow symbols um this is a, a downward arrow the arrow symbol is used to outline the path users take along the user journey so um 
uh, the arrows, um, whether they are up or downwards, would represent the path that you're taking. Um, the flow in itself is represented with arrows. Iterating on designs based on feedback. Iteration in design in product development refers to refers to the process of designing, testing, analyzing, and refining a product. Remember, we've talked about iteration before, and I did mention that um, iterating is basically, um, I think in the most basic way I can put it, just um, you've created something, usually an MVP, or you've created a prototype, and you've had people go through it, most likely, yeah, most likely your stakeholders take a look at it, and um, with what has been discussed with them, they are going to give you feedbacks on what is plausible or what is doable or what is viable with everything that you've, um, with every idea that you have for the product. They are able to um, come up with, um, make decisions and maybe with the, with the information that they will provide to you, which is where you start doing um, your analyzing. This is where analyzing comes in. The information that you've provided to them, they're able to give you feedback and they give you a feedback, you go back and iterate on that. Or it could be um, with the MVPs, with your MVP it could be your actual users um, that would um, survey or, or um, just give you, if provide a loop for feedback and they give you feedback, you go back to your dashboard or to your board and um, or thinking board and brainstorm and um, fix what it is that has been uh, pointed out to you. That's what iteration is, that, that whole process of, collecting feedback and working on the product to improve it from feedback. That's what iteration is. Um, the process aims to improve the quality, the functionality and usability of the product by continuously learning from feedback and performance data. In essence, it gives you the opportunity to turn back time. Without it, product leaders would be forever churning and churning out identical products riddled with the same old flaws and left with no room to rectify them. This is also the beauty of um, Scrum or Agile methodology. It gives room for iteration and um, product improvement. Um, the iteration cycle is all about continuous refining. It's rotation between creation, testing, and learning. It's a rotation between creation, testing, and learning. You build something, but it's put it to the, to the test, see what works and what doesn't, and then use that knowledge to make it even better. So um, basically, iteration is build, test, learn from feedback, test and get feedback, learn from feedback and um, improve. Um, and then use that knowledge to make it even better, yeah. This iterative process continues until you have a product that truly shines. The iteration cycle is a, com is a continuous feedback loop. The exact flow of an iteration cycle can vary depending on your team's preferences. Um, okay, so um, usually a cycle or a period of time is given or allotted to iteration, right? Um, and some people allow iteration throughout the life cycle of a product, right? Like we receive it, which is how, that's basically how product management is the maintenance um, cycle of product management works. You um, update a product usually based on feedback, sometimes from feedback um, received from user research or market research, um, seeking to improve product, like your product. But um, usually, or sometimes, Iteration is giving time, especially when you're still developing. You just have um, like one week or a few days um, allotted to iteration where you start getting feedback from different stakeholders. Could be your customers, could be other teams that would be working with the feature or that will be communicating or interacting with the customers. Yeah, they, like you, you might want to give like three days for your iteration cycle or some, for some people weeks um, for your iteration cycle. It just really depends on your team, what works best for your team, or what has been working before you join the team. To so give you a common structure, which will include launch and real world testing. Get your product out there, this initial launch, sometimes called deployment, puts the product in the hands of real users for real world testing, right? 
continuous feedback. Testing doesn't stop after launch. Yes. Um, through beta testing, we're a, we're a limited group of users provide um, feedback. This is what I call controlled life um, or ongoing user interaction. You will continue to gather feedback on bugs and identify areas for improvement. So this is why every time you go to a product manager's backlog, there is a book to be fixed, right? Um, with when once you release your or you launch your product, there will always be um, feedbacks, and which is why every tech app out there or every digital app out there has a CX team that manages feedback information received from received from users. And the feedback management that the CX teams do is a very important role. Like I, I, um, I think some people actually get certification for that, um, being able to manage information gathered from, um, from, from users. Where you also have to document, you also have to collect tickets and share them amongst the teams that need them, like the product team. Um, is is a, is a very important role. There are certifications for them. That's how important it is. So, um. Once you've received, you've um, released your beta um, product or your beta version of your product, you um, you start receiving feedback. Um, it says yeah, the testing doesn't stop after launch. So um, the, the this particular this continuous feedback or looped feedback um, mechanism is for continuous improvement. It doesn't ever stop at every stage of the product. For every new feature you add. You, you continue to receive feedback and you continue to, to work on it. Analyze and learn. Once user testing is underway, it's time to evaluate the product's performance. Are users happy? Did anything une unexpected pop up? Do specific features need adjustments? This critical assessment provides valuable insights for the next iteration. Then planning for next iteration. Based on your evaluation, you plan the next round of improvements. <coughs> this might involve adding new features, refining existing ones, or addressing any bugs encountered. Um, this step marks the completion of one iteration cycle, paving way for the next. So the cycle then repeats and continuously refining the involvement, um, refining and evolving the product over time. So again, let me, um, this is what the iteration cycle looks like. There is a launch and real world testing um, phase. Uh, I don't know whether to call it a phase, but this is where you launch um, or you release your product to the world or to real users. And then this is where you set up a continuous feedback system, which is where a CX team comes in. Um, also sometimes if we are talking about FinTechs or any type of financial um, um, app or um yeah, any any type of financial product, you might you will most likely need a, a fraud team that handles fraud complaints, right? You set up all of those things for feedback. Um, the feedback from those teams are very beneficial for your iteration, and then you have the analyze and learn where you um, all that is collected from these feedbacks is used for analysis, brainstorming, and um, looking forward to new improvements that will be made to the features or new features that will be created based on complaints or um, specific concerns of users. Um, then it helps you decide on what your next iteration would look like. And then um, you start planning your actual next iteration, how long you want to give to it or what you want it to look like. And then um, this is also where you, you start to address bugs um, that have been encountered with your previous features. So in conclusion, to conclude, prototypes are like blueprints and mockups, blueprints and mockups for your product. Prototypes are more polished, clickable, are more polished clickable models that bring the design to life with visuals and interactivity. Flowcharts are diagrams used to represent the expected user interaction interaction from their first discovery of the feature to the final interaction with the feature. Okay, um, let's go over this again. Prototypes are like blueprints and mockups for your products. Proto prototypes are more polished, click are more polished clickable 
are more polished clickable models that bring the design to life with visuals and interactivity. Remember, um, we also have two types of prototypes, which is um, Hi-Fi and, and Lo-Fi. The Hi-Fi is where you have the more visual presentation or something that is closer to your actual um, product. The, 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 vi the visualization is more pronounced and the interaction is more, um, is more efficient where you can click on one thing. And this is just like a drawn up representation, but you click on it and it flows down by itself to the next thing. That's what um, a hi-fi um, representation looks like or a hi-fi prototype looks like. But a lo-fi is more lines and, um, you know, rough sketch, but usually digital these days. And then um, a flowchart, um, or flowcharts are diagrams used to represent the expected user interaction from the first discovery of a feature to the final interaction with that feature. In the building user journey with flowcharts, it is... It's important to cater to all existing use case scenarios for the feature, such as the journey a user, a new user will take versus the path an existing user will take. So it's saying here that your flow charts should be able to cover um, the experience of different user types, right? Um, usually for most, um, for most products, you will have existing users and then you will have inc like um, newly onboarded users or um, potential users, right? So if someone is a potential user, their user journey will be different from the user journey of an existing user. So you need your, um, what you call that, your flowchart to represent that. Even if this is the beginning of your the very first um, development of this product, you need to consider those two flowcharts and how the interaction would look like. Um, and also, this is also where you think about the um, feature dependencies, right? Um, if this if this person already exists, do they need a particular feature to show up for them, or do we want to take out this feature? Like it, your flowchart needs to represent those things. As you must have observed, the opportunity to make your product better is built is built right into the process itself. This constant feedback loop ensures your product keeps getting stronger with each iteration. So. The whole point of an iteration or, or um, a feedback loop is to continue to improve on your product. Now, how often you do that is dependent on you and your team. So again, to go over what was discussed, we talked about prototyping and, and the two types of prototyping. And those two types of prototyping also are, um, can be further divided into two types on their own. Um, so we have for the... Yeah, for the low five, we have um, the quick or rough paper sketch, and then we have the digital wireframe. And then for the high five, we didn't define this for you, but this is easy to just research online and find it. So um, just even a simple Google will give you a lot of materials on this. And there are mock-ups, and then there are coded prototype. A coded prototype will be um, a mock-up doesn't need codes per se. Um, a mock-up is just um, like a full of high high fidelity prototype, right? That you can create by yourself. But um, a quick prototype will need a code to um, make some things happen, to make something flow into something. So usually they are more complex, but they are also more um, more visualized and more structured and more realistic, right? Um, but mockups usually get the job done. So most people don't bother coding um, for prototypes. Um, okay, then we talked about the user flow, the flowchart, the flowchart symbol. We have talked about um, there are certain symbols that are let's get to that. Okay, different symbols represent different things. The cylinder symbol um, is called the terminator symbol, right? Once you see the cylinder shape as a terminator, it's used to represent the beginning of a process or the beginning of a user journey all the way to the end of that user journey for a particular feature, right? And um, the action symbol is the rectangle symbol. It shows, um, it shows um, like, how do I put this? Um, the actions, like just what it is that um, is expected that um, a user would do, um, like something like if a user has to click 
right it's not like it's it's not a passive symbol it's a symbol that requires that shows um an act that an action is needed if it says click here if it says if it says close tab if it says um scroll back something like that you need to, it's, it's like um a request for an action basically so you represent that with a rectangle so the decision symbol is used to represent um having to choose between two options right um yes or no or between more than one option right um you need to say yes or no or you need to choose um between more than one variation of a feature and then you have the input and the output you're either typing in something or copying and pasting something um and providing it to the system or the system is providing you with something itself um it would usually come out like um you as a product manager would would have to represent that with, um, in a rhombus this is a rhombus shape and that is what it represents um an output or input and then the the arrows are the um the flow like represent the flows of um um, the flows of the flow of activities or the flow of actions. Um, what was the last thing? Okay, iterating on designs based on feedbacks. We talked about the phases of iteration, um, how you start by launching your product and then um, you create a feedback loop and you continue to receive feedback and work on it and improve and all that. So that brings us to the end of today's class. I, I, I don't think I need to go over the conclusion again, but um, we'll just take questions. If you have questions, um, do raise up your hand. Uh, I don't know if Emmanuel is still I said Emmanuel. I don't know if Joshua is still here um, to help us with that. So I don't continue going from screen to screen. Okay, so um, if you have questions, just um, indicate and I'll call you your questions or if you would rather ask them privately or um through chat then that's up to you um if it's a question that you do not care for someone else to hear about it, it or you're shy feel free to reach out to us um joshua in particular uh, it's easy to reach out to joshua um via via dm and he would respond or if he is something he doesn't want to take by himself he could reach out to me and i can respond to you but if you're open to ask questions here you could ask raise up your hand and i'll um, call you up to ask your question okay in the absence of any hands raised i want to be optimistic that this shows that um i have explained my material so well I have explained my material so well that you do not need that you do not need um uh, you do not need to ask questions so um i can pat myself on the back that i did well today and i want to thank everybody for showing up and um being a part of the session and staying true to your purpose for um signing up with this in the first place um thank you and well done to you and even if you don't receive student student of the month um, um recognition as far as you know you're putting in your best your best is um recognized and um that's that's okay to do your best give the best that you can and learn as much as you can and um i wish you the best and um good luck with next week um especially monday i don't like mondays so good luck with next week and um see you during the weekend but you will hear from us about your assignments hopefully before the close of before close of business on monday um thank you again and do have a lovely rest of your weekend bye everybody thank you ma